Uh, thanks for coming, guys. Thanks for tuning in. Um, my name's uh, Laura Stafford. I'm the uh, community brand manager here at Finisterre, and we've got Tom in the room as well. Um, Tom will be with you shortly. Um, so good to see so many familiar faces. Um, actually can't see anybody, but we are really looking forward to a time when we can have people back in stores, when we can have you guys and girls down to visit us at Will Kitty workshops. Um, so, yeah, hopefully you can see and hear us in the meantime. But, um, um, yeah, we, we, of course, hope that you and your families are keeping well and um, staying entertained um, uh, the best that you can. So, um, for those I have seen, we've been hosting a series of online events, including screenings, repairs, tutorials, and workshops. Um, a note for this weekend, we've got um, the return of our breeding workshops with um, Ambassador Hanley Prinsloo from South Africa. So she'll be taking the reins on Instagram this Saturday at 9 a.m. If you're looking for some stuff to do over the Maybank holiday. Um, just while we're waiting for a few more people to join us, um, uh, so before we get started, maybe a little bit of housekeeping as to how this will all go down. So um, Tom will be walking you through a short presentation on the founding of Finisterre. Um, our business journey from 2003 right up to today um, uh, with a few anecdotes and stories and behind the scenes uh, insights. So um, Tom will be, oh, Tom's there, we'll be with you in a second. Um, the, um, uh, I'll be sitting in the comments feed, so I'll be there signposting towards any relevant reading material, anything uh, further reading, be that B Corp or, or whatever, I'll, I'll be there so you can, you can take that away and in your own time. Uh, there will be time for Q&A afterwards. So in the meantime, please submit your questions, comments in the, in the Q&A in the comments feed. We'll compile them and, we'll, and uh, Tom will answer as many as he can at the end. Um, thanks for tuning in. Um, please stay connected to us. Follow us on our social, sign up our newsletter. We'll be continue to bring you inspiring stories from you know, our community of ocean activists, sea lovers and the like, and, and updates from the business. So um, without further ado, thanks for your support. I'll hand over to Tom. Uh, cheers for being with us. Thanks, Larry. Um, hi, everyone. Um, I can't see you, but uh, I can see how many people are there. So really appreciate uh, people tuning in to hear the story of the brand uh, I started um, 17 years ago now. And I suppose just wanted to really check in with everyone and hope you're all well, your families are well, you're looking out for one another. Um, I definitely, you know, finding that um, some days are good, some days a bit more of a grind. And um, I guess it's, um, and that's, that's kind of how things are. I've got a big announcement on Sunday. And um, the team in here have been working really hard actually to make sure we stay really close to our community, our customers, keep feeding good content, keep engaging with you. And um, it's been a really, it's a really amazing time. What, you know, the, the team have been really sort of digging in and sort of stepped up. Obviously no one's working from Milk Kissy anymore. Uh, all our shops are closed. Uh, but it's where we've been really building our community. And I thank you for all the message. We've had an amazing message, support, encouragement. I uh, love what you're doing. Um, so please keep them coming, keep suggesting ideas, anything you'd like us to do or like us to see from us, please, you know, that's kind of the way the brand works and always has done. Um, and I think it kicked off, you know, six weeks ago, I did a post uh, regarding the resilience of nature and where I go to find inspiration, at, you know, times when the world is maybe a bit more challenging than it's used to as it is now. And for me, this was just at the time the arrivals of swallows uh, in this country. And for me, since I was a tiny boy, that's always been a big thing that my mum and I had a big kind of race to see the first swallow and know this little bird, you know, had traveled uh, all the way 8,000 miles from South Africa to spend the summer on our shores doing, you know, for, you know, for 40 days nonstop, 200 miles a day and arrived here. And that always represented something really kind of symbolic and powerful to me. So it was great um, to be able to tell you that story and I had so many really great posts from it. So again, the resilience of nature, I think, is all around us at this time, particularly sort of spring is here, summer's around the corner, um, and it can be found in any town, city, backyard, anywhere you look. So um, that's kind of a still a thing I'm, I'm kind of getting a lot of inspiration from. So um, thank you, everybody. 
the kind of format, as Lauren said, is basically, I'm going to give you a bit of a talk about the brand and the journey we've been on, I think. Um, it really covers uh, three or four sections. The first one is the, you know, the idea of the brand, where it came from, and the values and the kind of founding, I suppose, cornerstones of what the brand is today, and having those at the outset. Um, secondly, into sort of the business reality of how you then take a set of values and bring them to life in a business that uh, has to survive in, you know, as an entrepreneur sort of journey like many people have experienced. Um, then I'll talk about, about the product, how you bring that brand essence and that brand, um, uh, those brand values to life in products um, that you then get to your customers or community and it means that the brand lives and breathes in, that, in, 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 in the product. And finally, a bit about the future, you know, where we're going, where is the future, what we're excited about. Um, and then that type of work, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. And after that, um, we've got it set up to so have live Q&A. And I think um, Lauren's going to feed any questions you've got to me and then I can answer them. Um, and please, anything you want to talk about, um, that's the kind of the, the kind of feeling of, 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 of the, the session. So, um, I will now hopefully share my screen with you. Um, bear with us. Um, okay, hold on a sec. Hold on a sec, everybody. Uh, Okay, can everyone see that? Larry, can you, can you see that okay? Is that good? Okay, I can't let, hey Lawrence, can you see that okay buddy? You're on mute. All good? Yeah, all good there Tom. I think everyone else is good, yeah, crack on. Okay, well, um, as I said, thank you very much indeed for coming along tonight, this evening, um, start of a long weekend. And uh, before I get going, um, the first thing is really, you know, talking about the business and the brand that it is today. The first thing I really want to sort of explore is the idea of Finisterre and where it really came from. And from, um, from my mind, I was really lucky. I was always brought up, um, originally up in North Norfolk and always had a really close connection to the sea. And this is something that um, I had in my life. And when I was, when my sister and I were younger, our parents said to us that how they talked to each other about how they liked to bring us up. And one of the things they wanted to instill in us was the love of the sea. Uh, and so I, from a very early age, um, we were in boats. Um, it was, the sea was around us. Um, I got into windsurfing, sailing, all the sort of, you know, the sea kind of activities you'd imagine up in North Norfolk. And then I think when I hit sort of, um, 14 or 15, um, the, I sort of discovered surfing. Um, and uh, the, the picture I've got up on the screen here is a really amazing one. It's actually one of the first um, images that I thought were, I liked, kind of that really tuned into me in terms of what the brand could become. And it's a photo of a rough sea. It's the, the best photo I've ever seen of a rough sea. I think it's, uh, you know, Gale Force 9 or 10 in the, in the, in the Dover Straits. Um, and why I like it is that you can see there's no real boundary between the sea and the air. And we use it in quite a lot of our comms. And it was one of the first images that I came up with, uh, with, the, with the brand. And so it really represented that kind of, that connection, I suppose, that awe that I have had with the sea. Um, and when I was, I uh, said, 14, 15, 16, probably my formative years, um, surfing became my all. Um, and... It was like many people at that age, I think it's team sports, or it's rugby, or it's uh, football, or it's photography, or it's music. For me, surfing was the thing that really, you know, really, I really connected with, um, and it became everything that I did, actually. I lived it, breathed it, ate it, slept it. Uh, I had every bad 90s um, dress sense that you can imagine. I had hair in those days. It was kind of straight and curly, so it was, you know, pretty confused. Uh, it's pretty good job it's fallen out. Um, and it was, but it was really about this sort of this identity that I had, and this this kind of this passion, this commitment that I had around this 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 you call it a sport, this activity that I was doing. And for me, it was more than just the action of surfing. Um, 
I still meet people who say, oh my God, you can surf in the UK or that sort of thing. But um, like many of you know, I'm sure that some of the waves we get around uh, this coastline and in Ireland are uh, some of the best in the world on their day. But there's a real commitment needed. And I kind of really resonate with this commitment needed to go and find them, to study the weather charts, to uh, work out, you know, the tides, the winds, everything. And so it's quite a fickle life because it changes so quickly, the weather, the swell patterns, you know, traffic, whatever it is. Um, so for me, there's a real commitment around the, the surfing that I was doing over here. Um, and so for that reason, um, I had a very, very in-depth relationship with this guy. Um, a lot of people smile when I put this slide up. I can't see what everyone's doing, but um, this is Michael Fish. Um, famously didn't predict a uh, hurricane in 1987, the day it happened. Um, and so but why, why this slide is here is really because I became obsessed with weather charts and uh, I became obsessed with understanding the, the weather and where I would have to go, I need to go around the UK to get these unbelievable waves. And it became an obsession with me in terms of this understanding and this kind of relationship I had with surfing that I was doing. Uh, and it was cold, it was, it was, you know, it was pretty tough, getting changed in car parks, you know, there's hail, there's east, east, you know, icy easterly winds. Um, but it, for me, the experience and the romance, I suppose, around that was something that really resonated with me. It was something that um, I, I kind of thought was, I had a lot more soul to, a lot more depth of in terms of the experience of the surfing that I was doing. It wasn't getting out of the sea and it's perfect four foot, four foot in board shorts and someone giving you a cocktail. There's a real kind of, I suppose, a grittiness to it, but also a romance to it. Uh, it was very real. Um, and these are sort of the, the times where we could go up to, uh, say, the this south now to Hebrides, Isla Lewis, and we would find uncrowded waves. And often uh, a call would come in. Um, it'd often be from Al McKinnon, who's a good friend of the brand, myself and the brand for a long time. And he'd be like, guys, there's a way, you know, the, the chart's looking good for this part of the country. And we, we would drive for, um, you know, for, for, for hours to get there. And this is, you know, this is us in the tent, uh, really living and breathing the brand. And it's really about the, the waves we discovered there. That's actually frost on the ground. We had a wood burning stove in the tent. We had to keep going the whole time because it's so cold. But it was it was perfection, and it was a real the experience of something that I really wants to represent. And the commitment was huge. And I think um, when I, that was the sort of world I knew, I suppose. And so when um, I went to university, I did marine biology uh, or biology of the marine sort of, really sort of focus on it. Um, and again, I was surfing all I could, uh, teaching surfing in the holidays, um, that sort of thing. And it was my life. And then I ended up working in London as a charter surveyor after I left university. I often do this sort of talk at university, uh, universities and, um, you know, the people I speak to are so switched on, uh, compared to how I was. I just got at the end of university, it's like sort of worlds ended as I knew it. At that point, my life had been connected to the sea, had been committed to the sea. It was everything I knew. And suddenly, uh, that world ended. I think like many things where uh, something is taken away from you, and it could be quite apt actually now, you, there's a real appreciation and uh, you, you know, strip back everything that is important to you and you realize what it is that's important to me. When I was in London, working as Charter Surveyor, doing a lot of you know fairly dry jobs and i kind of felt my you know all of this life up to now had sort of ground to a halt and i just didn't want the um that world the world that i had known and the world that i was passionate and believed in um to come to a standstill um so i started to work out ways how i could you know repurpose my life um with um something that would be my passion would be purpose-led would really uh, be, a, be a great thing. And um, as I said, I didn't have any business degree. I didn't have a fashion degree. I didn't really um, have much of a clue, to be totally honest with you. Um, but what I believed in was that creating a brand with a set of values at its heart and you know, through hell or high water, sticking to those values. Um, and so I started thinking about all the things that are important to me. And again, it was about, um, product that actually needed, you know, back then, this is the early 2000s, a lot of the brands that marked themselves to me were selling 
product that was totally irrelevant to me in the world that I knew. Bikinis and board shorts, you know, it was freezing cold, it's windy, it's rainy. There was this sort of need, need, need for that sort of product. Um, again, it was about sort of product that you needed, product was built to last, it was functional. Um, it was really important to me, I thought, the, with regards to where the product was made and what it was made from. So the sustainability element to it, I think, you know, that was what I set out. I think that was really, really important to have that at our heart, at the heart of what we was doing, why we were here. And finally, it was really about this, uh, you know, connecting people to the sea and having this, having this ability for the brand to connect people to the sea and hopefully inspire a relationship. From that relationship comes guardianship, comes love, comes protection. And our product ultimately enables that connection. And that was, those are the three kind of commitments, I suppose, the pillars of commitment that I had. It's committed to product, to environment, and people. And you can look at our first our website. It was me and my sister, as it was in the, in the early, very early days. And we had, we, that was what we'd written down as our, as our kind of founding beliefs and what we were going to you know, build around a brand. Finisterre was the name. Uh, it's an old shipping forecast area. I'm not sure who knows or hasn't listed shipping forecast. It's a really amazing British institution covering all the sea areas around the UK. And it's for uh, people out in, in boats, fishermen, sailors, seamen, that sort of thing, or you know, anyone out in a boat. And it covers all the sea areas and gives the forecast for the next period in the sea areas. And Finisterre was one of those sea areas. It means end of the earth, land's end. And it's one of the biggest areas. And I can remember when I was younger driving around in my parents car listening to the forecast before the radio 4 news and it's a really sort of um ethereal way that the forecast is read because it's very formulaic and it really is about saving lives at sea but at the same time it's a very romantic way that's read and um you start to, i start to understand the uh the, what the areas series were what they meant um and finisterre is one of those areas and so for me the shipping forecast and that kind of romance to uh, the, I suppose the life we know in the British Isles is, is, is a big thing. Um, and like the forecast, there's a real, it is there to save lives at sea, but also there's a lot of people listen to it have never been out in boats and a lot of romance to it. I think there's similar strands of that romance and reality running through uh, what we do at Finisterre. Um, so that was kind of, I suppose, the, the sort of the, the ingredients for the brand. Um, that was, it was a Finisterre commitment to products, environment, people. We were here to affect change, an industry that I really believed that needed it. We we're here to connect people to sea. Um, and you know, that, that look, you know, that, that's the sort of point in the talk normally where it's like, that looks really nice, a bit of paper and sounds great and stuff. But how do you then transfer that, um, those ideas into a, into a business, into growing something that kind of becomes the brand and business you see before you? So um, for me, um, it was really about our first product. Uh, and it was about building a product you needed, would last a long time, was made locally, uh, and was, would, was, was, was kind of representative of all the commitment that I've talked about. And so I made this fleece, and it was windproof, waterproof, breathable, um, and it was like nothing had anyone ever seen before. Uh, it was bombproof. And people, um, because of the story behind the brand, there's a really great functional element of the product. It's made in Devon by a guy at Clumpton who brought it down in the back of his um, 80s um, Vox or something or other, gave me a load of fleeces. Um, and there's a story about why we would build, why I was building this brand. We actually started to get quite a lot of tension. I can remember our first ever write up was Sunday Times Good Gear Guide. It's about this big. And it was all about the you know, soft, beautifully made product for. Uh, you know, cold bodies in Cornwall sort of thing. And that's kind of why I started. So you get out the car park and you didn't change the car park in the middle of February. This is the product you needed. And it wasn't, it wasn't represented, represented anywhere in the, in, in, in the world that I knew. So it was this fleece. And a lot of design students say, well, how do you design a fleece? How did you, um, you weren't a designer, you'd done biology, marine biology, university, whatever. Um, how do you go about it? And it was literally, if I told any one of you to do it, it was basically the same thing. And it was, um, you know, my sister's involved, my mum was involved, my friends were involved. Uh, I'd get bits of uh, fabric, I would, I would wet them, I'd put them in the radiator, I'd blow through them, leave them out in the sun, and got some samples together. Uh, drove around, visited three or four manufacturers, um, 
and made 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 this product. And uh, what is amazing is that it's not you know our range has moved on considerably since then, as has the way you dress in terms of functional outdoor elements. Uh, but it is you do still see them around today, and people you know go on about them. So 17 years later, to see the products still around today, our very first products. Uh, with intention to build a product that really lasts a long time and you need it was something that was um, was uh, I'm really proud of actually. So that's always good to see. Um, and then it was a three-page website. It was in the flat above uh, my above the surf shop in Snagnus, about 300 meters from where I'm talking now. Uh, and it was a dial-up modem. You you had to get your housemates off the phone to get on the internet. It was days that many of you will never have experienced. Um, this real start of e-commerce and the real start of, I think, newsletters and community building. And that's kind of what we've always done as a brand. We've always had a direct uh, relationship and um, way into our customers and our community, which has been fantastic. And I really, I really, uh, really, we really value and uh, are appreciative of. Um, and it was a three-page website. Uh, one page is the brand commitments I've talked about. The other page is the surf forecast I used to write. And the third page is the product. Uh, and uh, we used to get checks in the door and I said package and send out fleeces. I was working part-time, um, Mondays and Fridays, I'd do the, the, the Finisterre, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, doing all sorts of jobs. Uh, and that's kind of how it started out. And um, I think those early days were really about that um, conviction, that kind of blind naivety and that optimism about like, what you can believe is possible. And I think it's really exciting when you see that in businesses because that kind of um, that kind of conviction and that you know not overthinking stuff and going do you know what uh, seven out of ten is enough to make a decision let's go for it because we really believe we are changing the world is a really powerful thing to be part of um, and so uh, the next part of that journey was really about starting to build a team together uh, a bunch of people that could help out build. The, the, the brand and sort of get together and be around a table and we're still that's still the office across the road from Real Kitty now that wetsuit hanger is still there the, the dogs are sadly gone uh, Dave's in the business Deb's in the business so, you know two guys that have been around since the very start and it was about helping us build build a, real, a really exciting brand and I think you know that that idea of uh, talk to quite a business uh, startups about it and that idea when you are you know six people and you are around a table it's obviously very stressful for money, the money situation the, the small business stresses that sort of thing but that kind of collective purpose and that power and that real belief that you are here to change the world is very very powerful so they were really good days uh, they were stressful days for a number of reasons um, but it was uh, about building a team and it's great to see uh, Dave and Deb's really kind of uh, big parts of the business, you know, uh, 10, 10 years later as it was then. So it was then about building a range and starting to sort of put a product together. And I think that's kind of, um, if I look at back at the business, I think the first five years when it was probably just me on my own mainly uh, was really about, I often say we're like a 15 year old human. The first five years didn't really know what we we're doing. The middle of five years were actually quite stressful and we probably uh, poked a few bears and we were kind of a bit, you know, working out who we are. The last five years, we've really kind of come into who we are as a brand and a business and why we're here. Uh, but all the way through that, that period, the founding commitments of a community product and environment of people have always been there. And that's been our, like our true north, our kind of guiding star with regards to the decisions we make in the business. And, um, so I often urge, I urge, urge businesses and brands to have that, you know, when you're starting something out, what is it you stand for? What is your point of difference? You know, what is going to be your true north that's going to guide you and stop you going off piste around decisions that probably are not good for the business or the brand? So and we've had those challenges, you know, it's uh, going into market you shouldn't have gone into, you know, trying, you're trying to say no to stuff when you've got to make ends meet and you've got rent to pay, wages to pay. Um, they're tough times, but it's, um, it's, it's really about the, the people that have joined along the journey as well. And that's one of the things that I'm really proud of in terms of the people that have joined the business. And I always want to set the brand up that was somewhere that had a really strong culture to it, uh, where we had an amazing bunch of people. And in the last seven weeks, that's been proved to me time and time again with um, 
the team that we have in place is probably 85 people in the business now. We have 10 stores, we sell internationally. The product range is you know, over 200 um, units or 200 plus units in the range every season. So there's a lot going on in the business, but um, it's about this exciting purpose, about connecting people to see, building products to enable that connection and that kind of real higher vision that we have that really gets everyone out of bed together, out of bed uh, and keeps us really tight together. So um, really exciting times. And uh, I think that's kind of gone from the, I suppose the founding sort of ideas into the business reality um, of how you then take that and grow a team um, and you have every single challenge that I think small businesses have uh, and plus we're trying to do something different and you know pioneering and innovative and you know bring a sustainability agenda to the table when there wasn't one uh, so we're trying to do quite a lot of quite a lot of things there, not just start a brand uh, or a business. There's a lot going on around the values of the business. So it was really challenging, um, and but something that we all believed in and were really excited about. Um, and so I suppose the next sort of stage of the talk is really about the um, how you then bring that brand ideas into the business values, into sort of life. And I've got, I think, three or four examples of uh, where we've brought the brand and product together in some really great, great, um, great examples. And you may have seen these, but I'll bring them up anyway. Um, so the first one is the Beaumont Projects. And um, in 2008, we won the Observer Ethical Business Awards. And that was quite a big deal for us because we'd be going for five years, slogging away down here, um, trying to make ends meet, trying to do something differently, and then starting to get uh, you know, a, a kind of a recognition, I suppose, from a publication like that is so well respected that hey look at Finisterre they're doing something different in the right way was huge and as part of that we decided to try and bring some of our fine fiber um, manufacturing back to the UK a lot of fine fiber you'll find in merino wool and it's very important it's a fine fiber so it's not not itchy next to the skin um, and so look that often comes from New Zealand and Australia and so but if you drive anywhere around the UK, you usually see sheep uh, in the fields. So we thought there must be a fine fibre source of our wool in the UK. So we looked high and low. We found a sheep farmer in Devon called Leslie Price, a fantastic lady, um, and an amazing farmer and so passionate about rare breeds. And she'd found a fine fibre sheep called the Beaumont um, and collected the only Beaumont remaining Beaumont flock back to her farm in, in, on the edge of Exmoor. And there's only 26 sheep, and that's not enough to make any products. So we're in a situation where we've got an intention as a brand, right, we need to find fiber sheep. It's, we want to source our, thing, our product more locally. Uh, and we have a lady who you know, knows animal husbandry and farming really well, but she's only got 26 sheep. What, what do we do here? And because we had a, the, the sort of true north around the brand values and now our guiding stars and you know, lead us in the right direction, what we decide to do, we're going to shear and store the, store the wool for three or four years. Meanwhile, Leslie was going to grow the flock out. And we'll get to a stage where we had enough wool and the flock was big enough, big enough to make some product. And that's what we did. And I think it's um, quite unusual for businesses to take that long-term view. Um, and we didn't see a, a return on our um, commitment for over four years. Uh, when he made a Beaumont uh, bit of knitwear, that's one of the examples you see before you. Uh, they're beautifully made uh, Beaumont wool, soft, soft wool, 100% uh, resurrected supply chain. Our product team did a fantastic job to bring to life. Um, and it's a really great example of product and environment yeah. people coming together. You've got a the product there. You've got the environmental story being a locally sourced natural fiber. Wool is such a great fiber. Uh, and source of uh, many of our products. Uh, and there's a people element to it as well, which is so important in terms of our relationship with Leslie. It's now over 12 years old and uh, it's still growing strong. Yeah. Lambing happened about uh, three or four weeks ago. There's now 300 plus um, um, sheep in the flock, British Merino, and it's a really great example of, I think, the brand coming together. Um, and I often talk about it actually in... Um, in talks that I do because it's also a really good example of uh, something yeah. that I didn't expect to happen when I started Finisterre. I didn't say I'm going to start Finisterre and in five years' time I'm going to start the Bowman program. But because you have a set of principles that you stick to and you believe, believe, in, you know, believe in and you really kind of um, you follow, 
it really means that uh, these opportunities present themselves and you get to that situation. And have we not had those, you could have either said, well, it doesn't make any much economic sense. We're not going to sell any product for, um, for four years. Why would you bother doing it? And uh, because we had that, we did bother doing it. It's one of the proudest things that, um, uh, one of the proud, proudest things I'm around the business in a minute is the Bowman Project. It's so, so exciting. And then we got asked to go to Savile Row as part of Prince Charles' campaign for wool. Uh, I got my John Deere boiler suit on, I'm a bit of a closet farmer, so I was chatting farming to all these people who were walking down South Road going, what the hell have you done to my street? So a really cool, another sort of unexpected, um, unexpected consequence of uh, um, having a set of uh, beliefs at the heart. So that's the first example of the Beaumont uh, project. The products are out every autumn winter and you know, it sells through really quickly. So. Um, the next uh, example I have um, of how the brand can really bring to life in, in a product is uh, our swimwear. So we have uh, in the summer, we uh, make bikinis and board shorts. And traditionally, uh, bikinis and board shorts made from nylon. Nylon is actually a very hard wearing um, polymer, but it's actually quite a dirty one in terms of the environment to make and very hard to break down. So it's okay in its life, but if you're looking at a kind of a circular business model, it's not, um, it's not great. So uh, we found a business called Econil, who are based in Slovenia about three or four years ago now. And what they do is they repurpose uh, discarded nylon from part recycled fishing nets. And there's 640,000 tons of fishing nets floating around the ocean at any one time. So it's a big, big, big problem. And old office tiles. And they repurpose them into an amazing five nylon fiber. And so this is great because we can use it in our bikinis, use it in our board shorts. We're now using it in some of our jackets as well. And it's great because it's actually a product you're wearing to go in the sea. It's been made from, part made from um, something that's come out of the sea and, you know, taking the rubbish out of the sea. So if Rear Brown's back connected to the sea, how great that we have a, um, a story around some product that is based around that. We also then gave 10% of our profits to Surf Skin Sewage, our neighbours here at Wheel Kitty that we work closely with. And so really nice sort of whole story around sort of the brand purpose, into products, circular manufacturing, and nicely back supporting a charity that's really kind of fighting the front line against uh, plastic pollution. Um, and then another, this slides up here because um, A, I have a suit apart from a wetsuit, and B, it was... Um, Prince Charles, uh, is, uh, we had a day uh, last summer where um, Prince Charles came to visit Finisterre and Will Kitty. We were actually a Prince's Trust started business and I wrote him a letter saying thank you for your help. And apparently he keeps all the letters that he gets. I think my mum probably told me to write a letter, which I did. And then suddenly we get a, um, uh, a letter comes to the post from Clarence House on really thick paper and fountain pen and all that sort of thing uh, saying they're going to come and visit. And sort of side stories, suddenly, uh, you know, 10 Range Rovers turn up and all the Devon and police, anti-terrorism, uh, Camilla wants to come as well. And it's, suddenly there's a whole royal presence around what we at Finisterre are doing in terms of ocean plastic solution with surfs against sewage. And um, it was a great day and one that I didn't expect to happen where we sort of talked to talk to his Royal Highness around uh, the work that we're doing around and uh, being a leading business, being a B Corps, uh, all our work on innovation, repairs, circular manufacturing, sheep breeding. And it was, it was a really good, it's a really great day. And uh, again, one that you, you can't expect to happen, uh, but did because of our, our founding values. Um, so next up, peel off and off about collaborations and, uh, we as a brand, a lot of collaborations uh, with other brands, organizations, that sort of thing. And um, yeah, we're really lucky that we get approached by a load of other business and brands. And the, the sort of point of view, our point of view of the collaboration is it has to be like a shared ethos um, and a kind of a joint passion, I suppose, to the promotion of what that, what that uh, product is gonna, you know, the result of the collaboration in terms of the product what actually is it going to be uh, and will that come across? So uh, the one of the first really successful ones we did a couple of years ago is the RNLI. I'm a member of the Snagness crew here, I'm one of the helm. I've been on the boat now for over 15 years now uh, and I have a pager, it can go off any time and the station's 200 meters away at Snagness Cove, just down here. 
Uh, and you never know what sort of um, shout you're going out into. But it's something I suppose I'm really proud of personally to have been involved and to be I'm, I'm involved with. And um, it's you never know what sort of shout you're going to go to. So whenever that page goes off, uh, your heart is in your mouth. But it is, a, it is, on one hand, it's not a big deal because a lot of people do it. There's 256 lifeboat stations around the country, teams of volunteers. But the ethos around volunteering, volunteering has been going for over 200 years. The online, so it is quite a big deal. So it's um, something I'm super proud of. And then when we spoke the online about collaboration, it was it was something that's very close to my heart about this shared kind of uh, passion to uh, promote the knowledge and um, safety of the of the marine environment. So we collaborated on a range of products, and the product that you see on your screen is a Polpero Knit. And it's a really good example of how you can bring a brand to life in the product because uh, that is um, named after the village of Polparo in Cornwall. And that is in the 18th century, fishing was a huge industry in Cornwall. And um, every single uh, village had its own specific knit pattern. So if you were from the village of Polparo, this was your knit pattern. And the, the idea was if you got washed overboard or uh, you, you, know, you drowned in the sea, like a lot of things happened then, they would know where you came from by your knit pattern. So a really nice story of how you can bring the brand equity to life in, in the product. Um, and a great, a great, you know, great collaboration. It's one very close to my heart. So we had a lot of great um, stories too. We had archive to access the archive, the RNLI archive. Um, and, um, Something that was, it was really, really successful. Um, another collaboration on the is when we, we some of you may have seen this last autumn with Vans. Um, you know, one of the most iconic uh, footwear brands in the world that everybody knows and many of us wear and have worn for many years. And um, Todd and the design team did a fantastic job here. It's actually our second collaboration with Vans, but uh, with this one, we wanted to push them to make. Uh, uh, limited, edition, limited edition range of shoes that was super um, sustainable and ecological and we actually all the design team we actually pushed fans to make this so um, it's vegan friendly leather it's recycled soles it's uh, repurposed um, PU, you know, it's, 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 it's got a, so many different elements to it but it was their most sustainable um, footwear little capsule collection that they'd ever done and I think why I use this example is in terms of A, the power of collaboration and B, in terms of the power of, you know, you're never too small to affect change. And, you know, we, we're, we know, you know, we're 85 people here. We're still, still pretty small. Uh, but the ability for us to push a you know, giant like Vans to be able to do this and great work for Vans being up for, for, for it as well. It's a really great collaboration. And the, the, and the, and the the, the foot was sold out really, you know, in two or three days. Um, and so another great story of how you can, the brand can bring to life. And more recently, we've just launched last two weeks, a collaboration with Natural History Museum. Some of you may have seen that. If you haven't, go and have a look at it. It's really exciting. And it's really about, with that particular collaboration, it was about using the past to inspire the future, the shared view of sustainability and protection of the natural world for generations to come. Again, the design team went to the archive uh, of Natural History Museum, which is actually bigger than the museum itself. I think it's just ridiculous what they've got down there. And they took inspiration from some prints from two pioneers who, in the 16th century, pushed off in the furthering of our understanding of the natural world. And that's been brought to life in, in the prints that you will see in the range at the minute. So another really great story. And again, Natural History Museum, everyone can remember the first time they walked in there and saw that blue whale. So, um, really exciting part of the brand to be able to collaborate with these kind of big institutions and brands that are up for uh, pushing change. And you know, we usually bring a really exciting innovation, fabric, sustainability angle, manufacturing, traceability, and also our creativity around the storytelling. Um, yeah, so the final story I've got is uh, around the products and the kind of, I suppose, matching kind of an outlook as a brand and um, our intention about you know, affecting change in, um, in an industry is the wetsuit recycling project program. It's about two and a bit years old now. And uh, we employed the first wetsuit recycler. Uh, the thinking here was that everybody um, 
has got a pile of wetsuits in their back of their shed, their garage, their car, whatever it is. And I've got loads at home and always think someone's going to come down and use it. They never do. And so it just gathers dust. And so I mean, while there's a lot of great progress around the use of alternatives for um, manufacturing of bio rubbers and tree rubbers, and we work with, our, with Ulex on our summer range of suits, uh, which is amazing. It's all about actually building a product that can, how can you increase, improve in, introduce circularity into the wetsuit industry because wetsuit manufacturers, they don't do it. They sell a wetsuit and you have it for a year and a half, maybe two years. If you're lucky, it was a good one, and then that's it. And you have to go read. So there's no circularity at all. So how can we look at introducing that? And we employed the first ever wetsuit recycler um, and that was quite an exciting, exciting sort of position for us to do, trying to stop 380 tons, 300 tons of neoprene going to landfill every year. Neoprene is incredibly unfriendly, environmentally unfriendly. They actually used to line landfill with neoprene. It was that, it's that unbiodegradable. Um, so it's all about the, the circularity. We made, we made a, we're testing at the minute the world's first recycled wetsuit. And it's, uh, again, it's, uh, we're not going to crack it in, probably two or three years, but it's about the brand, the role of the brand, I suppose, with having an intention where there's a problem in the industry. Our role of the brand is what can we do to solve it and how can we work it out and what's our commitment to doing it? And we're going to employ someone to try and work it out, mentored by Exeter University, where they've got a center for material engineering and try and figure this problem out. And it's not going to be a quick fix. It's not going to be sorted tomorrow or next day or next year even. But it's about this honest dialogue with our community and our customers and saying, listen, this is our intention. This is what we're here to do. And uh, um, I actually personally get quite excited about things that are known and the brand's role in, in discovering that. Um, so, uh, and finally, uh, the sort of talk about the future and where the brand's going, what we're up to and that sort of thing. I can't see a show of hands, but... Hopefully, people have heard of B Corp, uh, B Corporation. For those of you that don't know, um, I've been aware of B Corp now for probably six, seven years. It was always something that I was intended the finish there to become, but because of a few other things with running the business and keeping everything afloat, it didn't happen for a few years. But three years ago, it became B Corp certified. And B Corp is an independent um, body that verifies, you, know, you, part, you go through very strict environmental and social uh, criteria to become B Corp certified. It's open to any industry, any sector, any country, any size. Uh, and it's really about saying growing a business in the right way. And you have to get assessed. You get above 80. If you get above 80, you become B Corp certified. It took us about nine months to become certified and covers every single aspect of the business from suppliers, from governance, suppliers to employees to governance uh, to purpose statements. And the biggest thing is you actually have to alter your article association. So as a limited company, we have article association, which is basically like a constitution that says we are here to do this as a business. And uh, historically, it used to say, as a director, I have a responsibility to max my stakeholder return, full stop. And B Corp started really because businesses are taking this to the letter, to the detriment of employees, society, uh, environment, and if, if there's a rock you're thrown at capitalism and this, this business sort of world that we're in, that's it. And so B Corp really came about because now in our article association, we have a duty to, to our employees, uh, environment, uh, society, uh, and our communities. So it's actually hard baked into our very constitution. It's legally binding that as a business, we have to operate in this way. And it's really about setting the kind of what sort of business are we now and going to continue to work hard at because we haven't got all the answers. We've got loads of work to do. We're just getting started on so many things. But help our customers and our community and the team in here. We really are driving hard to deliver change. And the B Corp kind of framework is really exciting. I'd really urge you to check it out if you don't know about it. It's really gathering momentum and it really is the business of tomorrow, our B Corp businesses, because they are saying, it's okay for businesses to grow, but we have to be doing it in the right way. And doing it in the right way has a, uh, a huge regard to society, to employees, to our communities and the environment. And it's legally binding. And we're going to be assessed again uh, in January 21. We're working already around 
improving our score, getting better at what we do. It's a constant evolving process. We've just launched our 2021 uh, or 2020 impact report, which is saying by 2030, we're going to be a positive impact business across everything we do, product, environment, and people. And you can, you can see that now um, on, the, on our website. And so, but it's again, it's about setting intention and saying, this is what business we're going, to, we're going to become. And we are committed to doing that and working day and night to make the best product we can, uh, promote circularity and have a really kind of strong community both out there and in here that is united by this common purpose of connecting people to the sea. Um, I think that's kind of, that's kind of, that's, that's, that's my, my, my talk that ended. Um, I can't see anyone. So I hope, I hope, I hope, I hope that's really interesting and struck home with you guys. Uh, I think we're going to now hand over to Lawrence for a few uh, questions. Yes, we are. Can you hear me, Tom? Yeah, I can hear you. Tom can hear me. Cool. Yeah, loads of questions coming through. So I'm just putting the last couple into my massive document. And we'll get to ask her who we'd love to collaborate with. Pete. Great. Okay, we'll keep them coming. I'll keep referring to that Q&A column and we'll, we'll try to crack through as many as we can. But yeah, thanks for that, Tom. Thanks for tuning in. I've heard the talk before, but I love hearing it. So, <laughs> um, okay, let's get going. Yeah, question one um, from James K. Uh, Hi, Tom. What do I need to think about in having ethical and high quality t-shirts made? Um, so I guess a question of our supply chain. Yeah. Um, Tom? Yeah, okay. Um, so, I mean, I think that, you know, there's a t-shirt, you know, what I'm wearing one now, obviously, the, you know, one of the most basic staples in uh, many people's wardrobe, probably one that's been abused in terms of its environmental footprint and um, social impact around the world in terms of the cotton industry. Um, so there's, you know, it's, it's one that needs fixing all our t-shirts are organic cotton um and there's a full sort of transparency element to it i think there's interesting um discussions around recycling of cotton now because uh you can make uh, t-shirts now from recycled cotton something we're looking at so in terms of sort of circularity as, as, as a business you know yeah it's the start of circularity is hopefully taking a material to make something with that has already been used to make something so if you can take a uh, an old T-shirt and make, repurpose it and make it into a new T-shirt, that's a really that that's the right intention to have. And I think it's about that transparency, that conversation with customers, uh, and also transparency both in terms of the comms you're putting out there around what the T-shirt is and where it's made, or what, where it's what it's made from, and also where it's made. Well, great. I hope that answered that for you. Um, second up, and we'll fire through these because there's loads more coming through. Um, it's from Carrie. Um, how have you protected those beliefs and values as the company has grown? Um, and can you describe a time when you felt like they might be compromised and how you navigated that? Very, very good question. Um, I could talk a lot about this. So um, I think having, it sounds really, really simple, but having it written down on the wall is huge. Um, and so, you know, if you're ever in a moment, a down moment or a moment of questioning, which, which inevitably is going to come, um, you can look up and you can say, you know, your, 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 your founding kind of beliefs and values are there and that's what we stand for and that they're there and we are, um, going to not deviate from those no matter what. And so that's the first thing in having them. And then I think it's about living and breathing them through the business. So our connection to see, we, with our team in here, we have Sea Tuesday where everyone spend, starts work late and spends the extra time going in and around the sea. Everyone gets a wetsuit when they join. So again, it's about building a team that is equally, and maybe more so, kind of passionate and committed to um, the, the, the business and the brand vision. And in terms of the times we've been, um, yeah, we've kind of we've gone off stray, I think probably six or seven years into it when there's suddenly there's like maybe 10 people in the business and it goes from being uh you know suddenly starts getting quite serious and i took that quite a lot on myself actually in terms of making sure the the people i was working with were looked after and you know they were you know they were 
um, yeah, I looked after them as well best I could. So there's quite a lot of pressure on that. And then with that comes an economic pressure. Early e-com days, nothing's really, you know, really taking off. We're going to trade shows. My sister's still involved a bit. We you know we're, you know, really, you know, trading like proper trading hard. Um, and so you probably go into markets or industries that are probably a bit off brand. So we probably did some things that you may, you know, like say we did some running shorts or some yoga pants, which are were very good products, but probably a bit dilutive for the brand and what we ultimately were there to do. But we kind of got led astray in terms of needing to kind of um, make some sales, I suppose. So I think that's probably my best example of a time where we kind of got, we started to go a bit off piece and then look up at the wall, why are we here? And you come back on track. Great, cool. I hope that answered that, Carrie. Um, next up is from Matt Dusting um, and one on the collaborations. Uh, what collaborations are on the horizon and who would Finisterre like to collaborate with in the future? So maybe a sneak. Yeah, so, I, don't know if you um, I can't reveal any collaborations that are coming, but there's some really exciting ones, uh, autumn, winter. Um, a foot one, autumn, winter, it's really exciting. Um, and then... We are looking, there's a, I mean, there's, you know, I think Blue Planet would be amazing to collaborate with. I've been talks with BBC about that. That's sort of not going anywhere, but that, you know, that's a great, you know, that's, you know, in terms of capturing the essence of what we do through a different medium that really struck a global chord and having that kind of in the brand would be really exciting. Um, um, yeah, I think just stay tuned for collaborations. Like, there's a few things I could talk about, but... I think just I'd rather not reveal them right now, but there's some. Um, I liked another one with the R and as well, actually, which uh, would be amazing because it had a great reach, and such a great reaction, and it's such a rich part of the brand's uh, story. I think. Great, thank you, Matt. Um, a really nice one here from Francesca Fernley. Um, do you ever worry about where your products end up, end of life? Um, uh, yes. So maybe something. Um, about you can answer within our positive impact report and our 2020 circularity roadmap. Yeah, great, great question. Um, do I ever worry? Yeah, I mean, I think you know the start of it is you know this whole sort of business circular business model and the kind of way. And even in the last six seven weeks, people are starting to rethink consumption and you know what they are buying and why they're buying it and they really need it. So the start of the sort of circularity kind of business model is starting with a raw material that is maybe recycled or part cycled or regenerated or natural. Uh, it then goes into the extending the, the, uh, the, the life of the product in the hands of the customer for as long as possible. So over just next to me is our power station here at Real Kitty um, and uh, making sure that we uh, encourage people to look after their product. And for me, all my favorite products are the ones that have been through uh, thick and thin, that have been repaired, have got holes in them, that you know, just about hanging together, uh, but have an emotional connection to them because I know they've been on this journey with me. So uh, for the most part, it's a, that, that we encourage that and uh, you know, Live the Loved is our kind of repairs uh, service that we try and help uh, customers do that to their product with. And then it comes to the end of life stuff and that's something we're working on uh, quite closely and it could be through a resale market where people can exchange their finished their products or exchange it for new products in, in, our, in our range so there's it's not just gathering dust and you're not you're not buying more you're replacing I think that's quite an interesting element of consumption now and the final part of it I think is getting to stage we're not quite there yet where we could we yeah you you could regather your, your polyester jackets and your insulation jackets with such polyester and we can repurpose them into a recycling scheme. That's something we're working on or as you'll see in our impact report. Great, cool. Thank you, Francesca. Um, next up, we've got another from James. Has the business brand always been successful? What's the biggest challenge you've had to overcome on the journey so far? Um, great question, James. I suppose it depends what you mean by success. You know, I kind of, you know, I suppose 
Um, we're 17 years old now as a business and we're still, uh, it's, it's mega tough on a financial footing. You know, we're still, you know, we're still um, working, you know, behind the brand, nice brand stuff we talked about, which yeah, I love it and I do it all day and um, you know, it's, it's a major part of my life. Um, is a kind of economic reality behind it and uh, paying wages and uh, rents and all that sort of thing. So there's a real, we have to, that, that, that's always been a challenge. Uh, and I think particularly with a business like this where you're doing things that haven't been done before, we're not just getting cheap on organic cotton and pumping out a t-shirt for 40 quid and making a huge margin on it, um, you know, like some brands do, businesses do. Actually, there's a real, there's a real worth to what we're doing and making as products. Uh, and with that, we've definitely uh, had to have some economic challenges around that because it's, it's harder to do that. It's hard to grow business on a set of beliefs that I ultimately say we can do things differently in the right way, and that's the way you believe in, but ultimately isn't probably so economically uh, beneficial to uh, our profit and loss account. Awesome, thank you. Um, one here from Andy Cross. How did, how did Tom, how did you initially start marketing Finisterre when you began? <laughs> um, it was basically just phoning up loads of journalists and saying, hi, I'm Tom make a top pain in the ass of myself. Uh, you could write about the story. And I think there's a few things. Firstly, it's about the sort of persistence and resilience, I think, of an entrepreneur's journey when you just get knocked back all the time. But if you have this sort of, this belief, this high purpose of what is, what you can achieve and where you're going, it is possible, you know, that, that carries me through this, this swamp of despair, I call it, where there's a really interesting thing you guys should look at. You should Google it. It's, uh, the, I think it's the graph of doing anything really worthwhile. And you have this initial thing where, that's a great idea. And you end the swamp of despair where it's really tough. You come out the other side. I think if you have that brand belief and what you're doing uh, and conviction, it can get you through these lows. So it's about resilience and phoning up loads of journalists, loads of you know, journalists not interested and in, you know, who are you? I'm a busy journalist, don't want to talk to you. But just really kind of forge those relationships with ones that can write about you. But it has to come with a story. So that was talking about earlier. You've got to have that story around what it is you're doing, that set of beliefs, what's your point of difference, why are you here? And so if you have that story, it's, it's something that they can write about. So again, it was about having a story which is genuine and our, our story really is authentic and genuine. And then really kind of, I would just basically ring up journalists and get, uh, I suppose, influencers maybe now or it's, um, you know, it's more digital press now, but I was getting write-ups in magazines and, and newspapers, and from that, people would be sending in checks. It was then, uh, and that's how that's that's kind of how it started. Yeah, in terms of the marketing, yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Um, next one up. There's a few more. It's just gone five o'clock, so we'll uh, we'll probably take a few more questions. Um, yeah, I'm good for a bit more if you like. It's cool. Good, 140 of you still logged in. Um, is a slightly different one from Hamish. If you had to pick three figures in today's society, whose ideologies you believe in, who would they be? Um, so, do you know what? I get asked this question or version of this question a bit, and I don't actually have anyone that I'm like, it's these people. For me, I, I get kind of inspiration from ideologies from very many different sources uh, and for me it's all about the resilience of the human spirit I did a blog post on it a few weeks ago but it was about so for me uh, close to my my family is my uncle who had cerebral palsy he was in a wheelchair his whole life and how he lived his life and he didn't have like a set of ideologies but his example to me on how to lead a life a severely physically challenged life was one that I got, I, he's, he's no longer around, but I got so much inspiration from. He lived such a full life. He got married, had independence, you know, had his own flat, even he, you know, drew with his feet, everything. And so for me, I have um, people that I kind of go to whose ideologies or the way they've lived their life, I think, um, where I need to get inspiration at certain times. It might, so that's one person. There's people in business, you know, there's, uh, 
who have done amazing things, who are, you know, I, think I find certain elements and interesting. So I'm not really answering your question with three people, but I am answering the question with, I don't think they need to be like, you know, these specific people. It's more about there are examples of people leading amazing inspirational lives in your communities all around you. And look, look looking at, for me, it's about looking close to home and using their, those, those values and those kind of way of living their lives to, to inspire me. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Hamish. Um, Dude, oh God, it's like um, uh, bear with me. Arthur, here's a quick one regarding the wetsuits. After recycling wetsuits, what's the next major challenge you plan to solve? Uh, that's going to take quite a long time. I could very easily twin that with another question, uh, which is bear with me. Lots of questions here, guys. Lots of good questions. Um, how do you see Finisterre's role in tackling climate change? Uh, and what more are you planning on doing? So, kind of... Yeah, uh, right. I, think, I think if, you, if anyone wants to read the Positive Impact Report, it's a really good kind of... Uh, so that, those are quite big topics. Um, but our view on what we're going to do as a business, and the whole the starting point is that businesses cause damage. I've talked today a lot about... Um, what we're doing, and it's by no means so perfect. We've got the answers, or anything like that. But it is about this. Um, it is about this um, outlook, I suppose, of business to really um, effect change and be the right sort of business. So it's moved from maybe having a negative impact now. And we're doing all we can to mitigate that, and our roadmap to being a positive impact business, so that we um, have a positive impact and that covers people, connecting people to sea and hoping that by connecting people to sea, that's positive impact. You're outside of the environment. We've, we've signed up to being um, carbon neutral by 2030 uh, and it's around product. And that's the promotion of circularity in everything that we do. So, so I probably haven't answered your question exactly, but there's elements to the positive impact report that will flesh that out. And if you want, if you want to get back to other questions after that, please do. Cool, thank you. Uh, I've just dropped the link to the positive impact report in the chat column there, guys, so please head on over. Um, another one here is, clearly Finisterre is ahead of the curve of consumer attitudes towards the environment and sustainability, which has allowed for leadership in this field. Um, what advice would you give to brands that are looking to embrace these values now? Um, so I think there's a few things I mean, here, going on here. I mean, basically, the first thing is that um, you can't start a brand or a business today without um, having these things, you know, into your your business. It's kind of like the appeal is sort of, say, hey, I'm starting this brand, it's sustainable. I'm like, it, that, that isn't new news. So they should absolutely be a, you know, a really strong environmental sustainability element to it. And the bigger thing is the, the purpose side of it. And you know, what, are you, what, what impact is your business gonna have on the world beyond just being a business? And that could be society, it could be environment, it could be a fair, well, there's many, many things you, it could do, but I think you've gotta have that. For me, that's, that's the big thing is it's, Underneath everything you have, sustainability, credibility, maybe your B core, that's all going underneath it. But above that is this bigger purpose. It's like, you know, what is our over the top kind of battle cry? What are we, you know, what are we, what are we here to do? What's our, our purpose? And how can we live and breathe that every single day um, in, 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 in we do? And it's, a, you know, if you get it right, it's a really powerful thing. Well, cool, thank you, whoever sent that one. I think it might have been an anonymous. Um, next up, so um, is Finisteg or creating any initiatives to educate our younger generations about sea conservation and being a responsible business? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think um, we do a lot of talks. A lot, you know, I mean, younger generation, you know, kind of we do loads of the university. Um, do a lot of talks with schools and you know both sort of secondary schools and, and primary schools. And I think the, you know, for us, it's about supporting 
maybe we can't do it ourselves, but it's about supporting, um, you know, say the um, Ways for Change guys or people who are involved in connecting people physically probably to the sea, uh, or it's the SAS next to us, the education programs, and it's about, um, or there's a really great inner, inner city kids surfing where um, Tom is involved in taking in, in, in inner city kids to the sea. And so any role that we can play in facilitating that and supporting that as a brand is the one that we, we take seriously and try and do as much as we can. And it's something that we kind of, we're constantly kind of looking to uh, support any, 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 it could be educational, it could be actually typical surf, it could be, um, you know, a lot, a lot of really great um, outfits out there that are connecting people and the younger generation, obviously the future uh, about this connecting sea. So it's something that, yeah, I think, and I think we all, you know, I, I do it personally in my life. I'm always taking in the sea. So it's something that lives and breathes the brand as much as we can. Yeah. That's super cool. We'll take a couple more. Um, there we go. How important to the business is the business's success has been developing a product range that appeals to non-surfers? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, you know, sort of surfing is the sort of story I talked to you guys about at the start and it's sort of my kind of route into it. There's always been this much wider connection to sea and um, it's really about making the sort of product that can enable the connection. So, every, you know, everyone has a relationship with the sea, in my opinion, and it could be, one that is very immersive, where you are, you live in the sea and you're in it every day. It could be one that you every week or weekend, or you just walk by the, with, with your kids or your dog or whatever it is, or just, yourself, you know, your friends. Um, or it could be one that you just, you know, you go down to sea every once a year. So there's this kind of scale of relationships that people have with the sea. And I think our product is really built to enable that connection. And that could be a wetsuit or something for the immersive people, or a you know, bikini or a billboard short, it could be a knitwear to walk or you know, long beach or a, 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 a jacket, a waterproof jacket, or it could be something a bit more removed. But you know, I think the, the you know, like a shirt, which is, you know, is, is an everyday staple, but on our shirt there, on our shirt buttons, the one behind even, you know, there's an example there, there's, it has the, the latitude longitude of the Sierra finish there. So even if you're just wearing a shirt, there, you know, can we as a brand, you know, emotionally connect you to the sea, even though you might be miles away from it. So you look down, you see that, you see that connection. It's starting to remind you of, um, of, of that connection. That's such a powerful thing. So it's, uh, it's not, it's not kind of really about an activity or surfing or, you know, you know, scuba diving, free diving, whatever it is. It's more about this emotive connection to the sea, and that's kind of what we want to instill in our community and, and, our, and through our products. Great, thanks Tom. Um, and one from Alex here. At what point did you realize Finisterre was viable to commit to fully? <laughs> That's a great question. Oh, if I look back at that and I think, if I look back and I think about all the risks I took um, in, you know, when it was two, three, four, even 10 years old, it's quite scary. But, um, it's never, you know, I don't think it's kind of, it was, it was always a commitment from day one, to be honest with you. It was never like, you know, because you go with, with on a business journey, you go through loads of stages and the first stage is, right, we're going to get business, so I'm going to call it something and I'll start a website and it's like I'm going to um, build a product and I'm going to get in touch with journalists and sell a product and I'll sell five products. You never, you never, it's never like, right, we're ready to go. And I think that's what I was meaning by, I think you've got an idea, if you're seven out of 10 on doing that idea, that's enough to really get going. And you wait till it's 10 out of 10 and right, let's go. It's never gonna happen. So for me, there's always been, but I think you have to have this sort of belief, this hard purpose that is just kind of pulling you in a direction and that's where your intention or whatever way you're going is. Um, and so with that in mind, that's always been there. And so the kind of, I, you know, there, there's times when, yeah, it's scary. You sign a new overdraft or you write a personal guarantee for money you don't have, whatever it is, to buy some more product, that sort of thing. That is really genuinely scary stuff. Um, but I never really thought about it too much. 
because I had this higher conviction and belief in what we could do and was on the setting out to do. And I think if you, had I not had that, I might have wavered a bit then, I suppose. Oh, that's great, a couple more. Um, I'll group these two together, but how can we educate consumers that sustainable clothing should not be cheap? Um, and I'll splice this with another one, is how do you reconcile the need to globally reduce consumption, including retail consumption, in order to achieve overall sustainability? Um, should we all stop buying stuff? Um, so, okay, so the first question, I'll try I'll sort of try and put those together. So it's this, um, I suppose that, you know, this whole sort of thing of, of growing a business and growing it in the right way is something I talk quite a lot about and this reconciliation of between growth and I suppose consumption and the planet and where we're at. And um, it's, yeah, it's a really interesting kind of um, dynamic. And I think the, the B Corp thing has been a big part of that. And, you know, as a business, if we grow, we can educate customers and we can effect change and we actually have more power and ability to, to communicate and to effect change, put pressure on uh, bigger brands we're working with or our suppliers or um, we can hopefully be an example of a uh, sort of business and sort of be pioneering in terms of how a business should be. Uh, but I'm not saying that we don't cause damage, I said a few minutes ago, or we have a negative effects on the planet. So that's where this kind of intention of a positive impact business, our intention to be a positive impact business by 2030 across all elements of the business really comes out. And you read that report, um, it's, we finished about two or three weeks ago, and it really brings to life all the intention that we have and things we're committed to. Um, so I suppose that answers this, hopefully answers a bit the second question. I don't think it's ever a done deal in terms of reconciliation between growth and effects on the planet. Um, we definitely should be buying less. There's no question about it and thinking about what we're going to buy. In terms of the first question, in terms of the education of worth of product, that's something that we're always, always doing. And, you know, people on social media are always calling out um, the price for products. And it's not, you know, we're not saying this product is for everybody, but this is our, this product that we see here has been built in this way by this brand uh, with, with this look and this fabric by these manufacturers that you can find out about. You can talk about the product. Um, it's built to last. We can help you fix it, repair it. And hopefully in its life, it can be recycled. That's kind of, that's that we, we kind of make that as visible as possible as we can. And that's kind of our, view and there's an economic thing that falls out of the bottom of that and this is how much it costs and i think our product is actually really really fairly priced cool thank you tom uh one here from martin bloom uh hi tom is long stand customer yours where i love the design material and the brand ethics i'll be interested to know your vision for the business and whether you see yourself in every high street or whether you'll be selected in physical rollout and retain your individuality um, definitely not. So we have 10 stores or nine stores um, and the role of the stores has been really successfully done by Lawrence is um, there are places people could go and meet and spend time in and plan trips on and if the brand could be a facilitator for connecting people that was a, that was a real privilege that I felt we had as a brand and so um, People would go to our London store and go to events and meet at events, then go on trips together or do stuff together. You know, that is what an amazing thing for the brand to be able to bring people together. So really, really, um, you know, real privilege for us to be able to do that. And we kind of, that was, that was the, that is the, what is the role of stores. You can obviously buy product there, you can see the products, but they're not, they're not, it's not like a crazy rollout um, with, you know, 50 stores around the UK and the way things have, changed in the last seven weeks that obviously you know there we're kind of looking at what the role of retail is um moving forward um but um yeah they've always been you know like this someone in the snagger store now really great place where you can go and see and touch the product and meet people and it was always a it was always to support the digital part of the business cool. thank you tom and uh yeah, thank you for that question. Um, the um, yeah, the stores. Looking forward to the stores reopening again. Um, you know, they're 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 catered for our events. 
our store staff in there are you know, well versed in the in the in the brand and the product and the you know our, our best advocates. So it's um, yeah, we really look forward to to having everyone back in store. Um, one here, really nice one. You mentioned how important your mum and your sister were at the start of the business. Can you talk a bit about women getting on the path of entrepreneurship um, in a still uh, very much male dominated world? Um, yeah, I'd actually, I, I, don't, I don't, I mean, um, yeah, so my mum and sister, big parts of my life. Um, my dad's no longer around. Um, so, yeah, my sister and I started, we used to go to the shows and, you know, uh, sell the fleeces. And that was those, those early days would fix the, the product around the kitchen table. Um, and in terms of where we are as a business now, there's actually more, more fem- way more female employees than male employees here at Finisterre. And um, what that brings to the table, I think, is just phenomenal. Uh, it, you know, it's, 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 it's been a really, you know, that's going to be a really good result of what we've created a brand. And I, I mean, I, I appreciate the, I suppose the, yeah, it, it is, it is historically and still is a, a male dominated world. So I guess if I can help that person out, maybe with an email or call, um, give me, give me a shout and I can, I can talk to you about that. But it's, uh, it was really, you know, we really encourage, um, entrepreneurship and sort of and i suppose within the business there's you know i've always been sort of managed the business in a way that there's obviously direction and what we're here to do but there's also amount of creativity around what people can bring in their roles and so everyone's kind of got hopefully the excitement of working for business that they brand they believe in it's have a higher purpose but actually there's quite a freedom to be within that platform and that higher purpose be entrepreneurial and creative within that so I've always, that's how I've, I've, I've run Finisterre. And I think within that, we have some amazing characters that are leading the charge uh, from a female point of view on that, on that front. Cool, brilliant, thank you. Well, it's just, just hit 20 past, we'll finish on a lighthearted question. Um, this is from Pete. Uh, when will we see Attenborough wearing a jacket? Oh, it's a great question, Pete. <laughs> Uh, good question, Pete. Um, I, had, I, sat, I sat and wrote my letter actually about six, I don't know, four months ago actually, um, with some products and obviously a big hero of everyone's. Uh, that'd be an amazing thing to happen. And something we, I, I like, I'm still working. It's, it's actually my, my sort of job list at the minute to maybe get in some natural history museum stuff um, because some of the prints are inspired by Charles Darwin notebooks. And it's really interesting, they're great, beautiful illustrations, but in his notebooks, he actually wrote horizontally and vertically. So there's to save paper. Uh, and some of that kind of aesthetic comes through on some of the, the really the collaboration that's launching now, it's launched now. So trying to get him in a Charles Darwin Hawaiian style shirt is something uh, hopefully I might be able to achieve in the next few weeks, but watch the space and thanks for the question. Oh, great. We have one last one slip through the gaps. What's yeah. the next step for Finisterre? Um, what would you like to achieve in the next five years? I think that's a nice one to end on. Uh, great question. Thank you very much. Um, it's really, uh, it sounds crazy, but it just feels we're getting started as a brand, as a business on everything that we can do and, you know, the world around and need to do, I suppose, in reaction to what's happening and in the world around us and, you know, being this right sort of, positive impact business and the right sort of business, engage with our community. Um, and I think, you know, pushing innovation uh, to, 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 to find better ways of um, being as a business. And I suppose I talk to you guys now and it feels that we've got a lot of the answers, but we're constantly working them out and having conversations in here about how we can do that, uh, as well as conversations and recommendations and suggestions from our, our community. So um, it's really about us, you know, growing as a business, growing as a brand, never losing sight of this bigger, higher purpose, connecting people to see quality of product and about that honest dialogue with our customers and our community and that we are on a journey and we are doing the best we can to get to the best product we can made in the best way. And that's a constant, that's, you never go, oh, we've done it, thank you very much. It's a constant kind of, process that we are we are committed to and work really hard at to deliver
Oh, well, I think that's a good good one to end on. Um, thanks everyone for tuning in. Um, this we will generate a link. Uh, um, we'll pop it on our YouTube page, and it'll be free from tomorrow and across the weekend. So please share. Um, like I said, head over to our social where you can see what we've got coming up over the coming weeks, months, um, updates from the business, uh, behind the scenes stories and, and beautiful storytelling from our community. Um, get in touch with us at hello at finisterre.com for anything else. And um, yeah, we look forward to stores reopening, Will Kitty being open and, and everyone being able to join us in the flesh. Um, and some final words from Tom, I guess. Yeah, just say thanks very much, everyone. Uh, I can't see, but um, I can see some of the comments. And uh, yeah, really appreciate everyone listening in. Hope that's been an interesting insight to the journey. And that, you know, that's honestly how it is. And we're really honest with the brand. So um, it's great to be able to just sort of tell you how, how it all happened and stuff. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks for the questions. As I said, we, we're, we're still here. We're still uh, working hard to really communicate and talk to you guys and get you good content. So. Uh, please give us ideas, feedback, suggestions, share stuff you like, and um, you know, stay well. And uh, um, hopefully, we can physically meet um, some stage in the future. Cool. Cool. It's safe. Good weekend, guys. Take care. Bye. Bye. Bye.